Welcome to a video review with theplayersaid.com. I'm Grant. Uh, today, actually this weekend, I played, I think I played it three times. The first time I wouldn't really consider it a playthrough because I was, you know, doing like we all do, kind of reading through the rules, pushing counters around, trying to understand what was going on. But you can see the, the, the title sheet up here, the front page is uh, Long Cruel Woman. The Assault on Firebase Marianne, March 28th, 1971. The game is designed by Paul Rohrbaugh and uh, published by High Flying Dice Games. If you don't know anything about High Flying Dice Games, they are a small publisher located in Ohio. And they do, you know, Paul does games on all types of conflicts and typically chooses lesser known, smaller types of conflicts. And then he uh, uses, in general, I think most of the games from him that I've covered, it has used a very specific card activation system. You can see the cards here. And these are the upgraded components. You have to pay a couple bucks more to get these, these cards. We'll talk about that. You can just use a deck of, of uh, playing cards. You're going to take out... Uh, one side's going to get the red suits, so the diamonds and the hearts. And then the other side's going to get the black suits, the clubs and the spades. And they will then do kind of like a war off to see who wins activations. And then the value of the card will determine how many activations or how many units can be activated that turn. So he uses that system in a lot of his games. I think I've covered maybe 15 or so games in the last four or five years. And I think every one of them but two or three use that activation system. It's pretty simple, works fairly well. It actually is very soloable, meaning you can just, you know, this is the VC side, I just pull the card, bam. I know what they got and then the US, okay, the VC won and uh, they're going to activate a number of units based on half the value of the card. So that, that's kind of how that works. So it's, it's really pretty simple, uh, but I think it works well. I think it also, the strengths of that activation system, and I'm kind of doing a little bit of a review as we go through it, the strengths of that activation system is that it's very hard to predict. It's very chaotic. You could actually win, I mean, when I was playing solo, I think my second game on Saturday evening, the US, and once again, I was playing both sides, but the US won, I believe it was five activations in a row, and they won those with fairly large cards. Um, so they were getting three or four activations each round, and the VC were unable, unable to go that round. So I, I think that's a huge strength of the system. I think it can be chaotic. It can be a little bit light and a little bit fun. To me, there's a couple of weaknesses with it. And I've mentioned this in another written review that I did about another game that uses that same system. You know, to be a, uh, you know, a game where you're trying a competitive game, you know, when you sit there and you lose four to five activations in a turn or in a row, that can really start to wear on you. You know, you want to play the game. You want to... So there have been times that I've kind of house ruled that where I've said, oh, no one side can win three or more activations. And generally that's worked and hasn't necessarily changed the focus of the game. I will say in this game though, and let me give you a little bit of a history of the, of the game. Uh, the Assault on Firebase Marianne, and no, this game is not misogynistic, neither is the title intended to be that way. Paul names his games based on popular songs of the Vietnam War era. So this name, Long Cruel Woman, is actually a play on the uh, song from the Hollies, uh, which was called Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress. And I think he used the Long Cruel, he substituted Cruel for Cool, because you're defending Firebase Marianne, a feminine uh, name, and that kind of denotes that, that this is a long, cruel struggle where the, the Americans are trying to defend against the assaulting VC, and they're trying to survive for eight rounds and not lose their units and not get overrun, etc. So 
That's the, the play on the game or the, the play on the title. The, the situation was that uh, this, this army group here at this fire base was poorly led, poorly managed, and they had kind of gotten into a, a rut of, of being not on high alert. And I, this one day on March 28th, they were kind of in the middle of a drug-induced, alcohol-induced um, malaise that led to them all being surprised. So when the VC start the game, when the game starts, every single one of the green units, the Americans, is covered up by one of these tokens, sorry, and it says suppressed on it. This is actually a pre-production copy that Paul sent me before the game went to print like six months ago, five months ago. Um, it actually should say surprised, and I think it does say in the new volumes. Mine says suppressed. On the back side, you've got a wire breached marker. And as an assault game of a fire base, you can see the map. The map is surrounded by a perimeter of barbed wire. There are also towers here, buildings. There's a uh, terrain value listed in these different circles. The circles are numbered. The reason they're numbered is you're told here's where you can bring in reinforcements. So when the VC get reinforcements, when they use one of their card activations to bring in a reinforcement, I think they can put them, let me, let me look at the rules real quick, uh, area 26, 27, 31, or 32. So the main force of the battle came from this direction. You can see in this game, and I think this was my final game, the U.S. actually won this very handily. I got some really good rolls with my airstrikes when my Huey support came in. I was literally reducing and then destroying counters pretty pretty quickly. But I attacked on two sides. You know, to be honest, the way the rules are set up, you want your VC to kind of be attacking together because it forces the U.S. to come at them, move over. And then uh, also when they're together, they get extra bonuses for fire when they're on their fire attacks. But yeah, you can see the terrain, pretty basic 11 by 17 map. It's printed on a fairly thick sheet of kind of a card stock. Uh, the, the terrain values you can see here, these terrain values have a zero. The area outside of the fire base has been cleared. There's a kill zone there. There is no terrain or protect, protective value for the VC as they assault the base. Once they get into the perimeter, the VC also gain advantage from these fortifications. They can hide behind trenches or buildings or debris or sandbags, and they get a little bit of a protective value. So as the VC, you want to get inside that perimeter because you don't want to have no defense out here and just be shot up. So they want to rush. They want to try to get over the wire, place, place these wire breached markers uh, because if you move over the wire without being breached, you can get your subject to opportunity fire and the U.S. can really tear you up. Um, but these protection values, you can see they're one slash two. The first number, and they're both in red, the first number is for the VC, the protective value for the VC for the terrain, and any surprised American units. So these units that have these surprise markers on top of them, they're going to get the lower value for protection. If they are unsurprised, they get a two protective terrain value, which makes it much, much more difficult for the VC uh, to actually land or, or score a hit. So those are the terrains. The buildings really don't mean anything. They do tell you in the rules and the setup for the U.S. There are two headquarter units. I've got the... Uh, the infantry HQ unit here, and then you've got an artillery HQ unit. They are also surprised at the start of the game, but they tell you where to put those. So they, they say place them there. The artillery unit cannot move. The HQ unit for the infantry can move. One of the goals of the VC is to kill one, if not both, of those HQ units because it makes command and control a little more difficult. They don't get as many bonuses. In fact, they start to get negatives. If these HQ units are surprised, uh, they have a, a di more difficult time doing what they need to do, hitting targets, putting up star shells, etc. So the VC really have to take advantage of that at the very, very beginning 
and rush these areas to get through and, and do some damage to those to those headquarters. So with that general understanding of the layout and the terrain and the advantages, you start as a VC with six units that you can put, I think it's no more than three units in an individual area, but you can set those up anywhere at the very beginning of the game. Then replacements, like I said, come from this area, the east side of the base. So really what you wanna do is you probably wanna put three units here, three units here at the beginning and try to really bum rush this area, killing units as you go, trying to get to this HQ. And you also get victory points as the VC for controlling those different areas. One of the conditions of the game that is an automatic victory, if you look here on this part of the game turn record track, you can see there's a resistance level and a morale level. So right now, the resistance level for the VC is at three, which is bad, and the US resistance is at nine. They had a really good time of it this game. If the morale level of either side is ever in this yellow area, there's a die roll, and if they miss that die roll, then they automatically uh, surrender. The VC are assumed to leave the battle, and the Americans give up. So the, the key is to stay out of that area because you don't want to force that roll. You also want a higher morale level because that's some of what you do with rallying and other actions. So you want to have a high morale. The game lasts eight turns. Each turn is a number of card draws. The card draw activation turn will end if one of two things happen. There's a joker in each deck if both jokers have been drawn by both sides or one side's all cards have been, uh, have been drawn. There are 27 cards in the deck. So you can see there's going to be, you know, each person's drawing uh, one card at a time and you're carding off. You know, you can potentially see a one single round take 27 draws and activations. And man, that could be... Uh, you know, a long, a longer game. Most of my games in playing this have been five to seven turns. Rarely have I made it as the U.S. to eight, and sometimes I force the VC to re to uh, retire from the battlefield earlier because of losses. But really, a fairly interesting game that has some pretty easy to understand rules. I think it has some interesting elements and choices. You know, you have to decide, for instance, as the U.S., how much do you move up and attack? Because you can only attack from one area to another area. You can't shoot somebody two areas away. So you got to move your guys up. You got to decide where you're going to place them. You've also got uh, Huey and artillery support as the U.S. So when do you use that? You only have three or maybe four points of that per round. Occasionally, you'll get zero because you roll a die to determine that. Um, but you got to use those wisely. Also, if you fire those air support or artillery into an area where your units are and you roll really badly, you can actually reduce your units. You got to be careful of that. These star shells actually add a plus one modifier to your rolls. You are attempting to get over uh, their defense value. And let me show you... A couple different counters to explain the the different values so here's a look at a VC counter you, you'll notice these are just numbers for identification purposes it's the 409th battalion of the VC uh, at the bottom then you got the cool silhouette at the bottom you've got three numbers listed the very first number on the left the one is that unit's attack value None of the VC units have higher than a one attack value. So they are not the best soldiers, meaning they aren't equipped well and maybe not, not trained as well as the US. The defense value is the middle value. So you can see they have a decent defensive value, actually just as good as the US troops of a four. So in order for a US soldier to attack and hit this VC unit, they've got to roll a modification. I think it's greater than or equal to. Generally, it's equal to. So on a 10-sided die, 30% of the time you're going to miss. And there's a lot of modifiers. They may have a modifier because they're hidden behind good terrain or, you know, the unit that's firing on them may be surprised or out of command. Therefore, they're going to have 
say, negative 2 or negative 3 to that roll. So all of a sudden, in order to hit, they've got to hit, roll a 7 or 8, and that becomes much more difficult. A 0 on the 10-sided die is a 0, not a 10. The final value, the 2 value, is their movement. So they can move two areas. Um, this is an area movement game. You simply move from area to area, and uh, that's what their movement is. Now, when they're reduced, the only number that really changes is their defensive value. You'll notice the 3 in the middle. It dropped from a 4 to a 3. So that's a look at a VC unit. Here, let's go ahead and look at a U.S. soldier. This is a heavy weapons team. The reason I know that is because they have a two attack. Let me just show you a rifle rifle uh, unit. So this is this is just comparing a rifle unit and a heaven heavy weapons team. The black bar is the heavy weapons. So the heavy weapons have a two attack. The trooper just has a one there on the right. The defensive value for the heavy weapons is less. There are three on the right. The uh, soldier, the rifle unit is uh, a four and then they both have two movement when they are reduced you'll notice their numbers drop as well the uh, heavy weapons team went from a two to a one on attack a three to a two on defense and then uh, their movement did not change and the rifle unit didn't lose any effectiveness in combat they still have a one combat factor but their protection went uh, their defense value in the middle went from a four to a three so that's a look at those units. Um, real quick, I, I want to talk about those fire, the, the, the fire process, the fire attack, fire combat. And I'm just reading from the rules here. They're, the rules are fairly well written. I think where this game really fell down was there is not a good player aid. So I'm going to grab this player aid. The player aid is, is really only helps you in the abbreviated sequence of play. So I use this quite a bit at the top. They do have the fire combat there, so you can follow this down. But I felt like in the rules, there's so much more additional information that I wish they had just written more of that on this play aid to make it more simple. Here also is the random events table. So this isn't the worst play aid I've ever seen, but I felt like it needed a little bit more because there's a lot of conditions as to what happens. So real quick, the fire attack. So any one unit, you can fire in the same hex. Let's say these three VC have survived and they are attacking this uh, American rifle uh, unit here. So they're attacking, there's three guys in there. They're gonna attack one at a time. So you can only activate one unit every card draw. So you can't activate the same unit twice or even three times. They can't move and then attack. They can only do attack or they, they can do a move. Uh, they can breach a wire. Um, you can also call in artillery strikes, call in reinforcements, put up star shells, etc. But the fire combat system, in essence, the, the attacking unit is trying to overcome the defender's defensive value. Remember, that's usually a three or a four, and then sometimes modified by one or two based on different uh, different things. So everybody kind of starts at a zero. So you subtract the target unit's defense value and the area's terrain modifier. So once again, let's assume this VC unit is firing on this rifle unit. They are in here, so their defensive value is a six. Four for their defensive value on their counter, two for being unsurprised and being inside the fire base. So they are at a six. So all of a sudden, they have a negative six. Very, very hard to hit that. There's also gonna be a plus one to that die roll if the target unit in the same area as attacking unit. They're located in the same area, they're close distance, so we're gonna be plus one. So all of a sudden, we're at a negative five. Hey, it's getting better. It's not gonna get much better, but it is getting better. You add the attacking unit's attack factor, once again, a one. So now we're down to a negative four. Plus one DR, more than one full strength sapper in the area. So there are two other sappers. You don't unfortunately get plus one for each of those. You only get a plus one. So all of a sudden, you're at a negative three. 
Negative one DR if surprised unit is attacking. That's not the case. Only the Americans are surprised. So once again, we're at a negative three. Plus one DR if there's a star shell present. That's not for the VC. If the US HQ unit is in play and not marked as surprise, the CD is raised by one. So we go from a negative three to a negative four because it works for both attack and defense. Plus one DR if opportunity fire, we are not doing opportunity fire. And then there's a couple of random events where you can get a chit and I'll show you these. These come from the random event table. You're gonna get a plus one die roll to one attack. So at this point, this VC unit is firing here at a total of a negative four. Now I know that sounds really daunting and frankly it is, but it's the way the game is and it really comes out to be that way generally for both sides. So you're gonna roll a 10 sided dice at a negative four to equal or either be the same as or greater than, you're gonna to need to roll at least an eight. So an eight and a nine is the only thing that's gonna give you a hit on that attack. So let's go ahead and roll. Oh, I rolled a three, that unit missed. So you can see that it's, it's combat's pretty hard. There also are VC artillery support strikes. When you call in one support strike, you actually get to attack two different times on two different units. So they can call an artillery strike here for one activation on these two different units and you're gonna roll and there's a conditions that you have to go through, come up with a final modifier. Most, most of the time the modifier is any from, anywhere from a zero, I've had a couple of plus ones, but maybe a plus one to a negative three or a negative four. That's just kind of the way the attacks are. So it behooves the VC to get a bunch of guys together. It behooves the Americans to stay in those protected areas and make sure your units aren't surprised. So that's the way attack works. Let's go back to this activation area because I wanted to show you that again. So once again, the left side is the VC activation deck right here. The right side is the Americans. At the beginning of the activation round, you're gonna pull a card. So the VC have a, have a 10, let's throw that right there. Now the Americans get to pull a card and they have a seven. So it, it basically like, it's basically like a war situation. 10 beats a seven, therefore the VC player wins this activation. Now, if you look at these cards, and that's why these cards are nice to have, the, the cards that come with the game. Once again, you can play with a face card, but these kind of tell you what you can do. It says VC player can activate a number of individual units equal to half the card number, dropping fractions, but no less than one. So with 10, this is the most activations you're gonna get with a card generally. The VC can activate five different units. So they can activate this guy to attack here, this guy to attack here. They could call in an artillery strike on both of these units for another activation. That's three. Bringing in a reinforcement, putting them over here is a full, full activation. So that would be four. And maybe they wanna go ahead and fire here on this guy because they've almost got him uh, depleted and he would be killed and removed from from the game but that's the way it's going to work you're going to go through those and then you're going to you're going to go back to the card draw so let's do that again the vc draws a queen and the american draws a nine so once again the vc is going to win now the the face cards give you a little bit of extra ability you can activate any three units or the VC player can call in one bonus artillery support. So basically this artillery support marker here that is in the three space, I could get an additional uh, artillery support for this entire turn. Not this card draw, but for this entire turn. These artillery supports go through the entire turn, which could be, as I mentioned earlier, 15 to 30, 25 of these activations. Also at the very bottom, the final ability, you can use this card, not activate any units, allow either one reduced unit to flip to normal status. So I could take a reduced VC and flip them back up to their full value, or I can take a unit that is off map and bring him on at reduced force. So the VC have this box that says VC sappers somewhere in North Vietnam, or I'm sorry, South Vietnam. 
and you can bring those off and put them into the game. They do have to go in these areas, so you would put him in here, reduce, but all of a sudden, hey, I've got a couple more guys there, and now I may start trying to attack over here because I got five guys over on that right side. So that's the way the activations work. I mentioned the jokers. Let's go ahead and I wanted to show you a joker. When the first joker is drawn, there's the American card. When the first joker is drawn, you're going to go to the random event table. You're going to roll a 10-sided die. I rolled a three. You're going to find the number here. Let me show you the REMFs. One U.S. unit of the VC player's choice is marked as surprised. Tree does no event if all U.S. units are marked as surprised. Typically, only the only case that all American units are marked as surprise will be at the very beginning of the game. So the reason that mark surprise is such a big uh, importance, if you remember going back to those list of modifiers, if a U.S. artillery unit is unsurprised or not surprised, it will add a modifier to attacks. If a unit that is surprised is attacking, they'll get a negative one modifier. So as the VC, you want as many of those guys to be surprised as possible. In fact, you want to kind of hit them really fast and heavy before they can get those removed and, and kind of go from there. Uh, let's go back to the activations. I want to talk to you about the other activation or things that you can do. So you can move one or two areas. We already talked about that using your movement value. Not move and instead do a fire combat. So once again, you can't move and fire. Attempt to place a star shell in the unit's area or one adjacent. That typically is you identify, you know, this unit can put a star shell in his area or any one of the surrounding areas that he is touching. You simply roll a die. There's some modifiers and they may, they may miss that roll and not be able to chase it. The bad thing about star shells is each time you use them in combat, meaning a star shell's in this area and you decide to take a fire attack on a unit in that area, you're going to roll a 10-sided die. And if it's a, an even result, the it's going to stay. The star shell is going to stay up in the air. If it's an odd result, it's going to be removed. So those don't stay forever. Typically, they stay two or three rounds or until you do two or three attacks and ultimately you're going to roll, uh, roll a, an odd number and it's going to be removed. Uh, other activations that can be done or actions that can be done with activations, you can remove a surprise marker. There's just a different role for that. We already talked about that. You can attempt to place a wire breach marker, and this is for the VC player only. And I showed you earlier that wire breached marker. This is actually an optional rule, but I like it because it adds to me a little bit of pressure for that US player. And as I'm playing solo, I just think it is more interesting to do that. You'll notice that I punched four of those. I was just experimenting in this game, trying to see if I wanted to spread my attacks out. You really only need one of those because the US cannot remove that. They don't have time to repair that breach and get that condition gone. But a wire breach, in essence, eliminates US units from getting an opportunity fire as the VC move across that border. So if they don't have that, the units kind of get hung up on that. They have to stop at the wire, and then those US soldiers get a free attack during the op fire, and they can do some damage as you're trying to get over that wire, as you would imagine. That's why wire is placed. Uh, you can also do up to two artillery support actions with one point being reduced from your support markers. You know, that's a very, can be very, very powerful, but those, those roles also you need sometime between a four and a, a, a six and a seven in order to hit. You can also try to do a rally check and restore a certain unit. There's a process for that. I'm not sure that I need to go through that. Uh, it, it actually is more effective if an HQ unit is nearby and unsurprised. So those are really the actions that you can do stacking in this game. You can have no more uh, than two friendly units in an area. Sorry, this guy was actually over here in this area. I think he just got pushed over. You can have no more than two units stacked together in an area. So you can see with the VC, you really want to spread them out because you can only have two, uh, two together in the same area. Other than that, the game, once again, it lasts for eight rounds. 
You can do one of these auto victories if the morale or resistance level is too low. The U.S. is simply trying to hold out. The VC are trying to take the area. The, VC, the, the scoring of victory points for the Americans, anytime they reduce a step, so anytime you hit a, a unit and cause it to either flip over or be eliminated, they're going to get one victory point. The U.S. also will score victory points if VC units have controlled one of these blue terrain areas because that actually resulted in a lost victory point. The v VC would have gotten a victory point. If the Americans shoot and eliminate these units and then can move in there to control that again, they'll get a victory point back for that. The big key for the VC, and the VC are the same way, is they eliminate uh, different steps. They'll get a victory point as you move along. Um, but the, the big thing is, is as they control these areas, and the only thing the other, the, the game doesn't have is any control markers. I think they should have had a little VC control marker because I had a couple of these the other day and I had to remember what I had. But as you get those, you're going to get victory points and hold on to those. Those victory points are retained. So the VC are trying to get in, kill units, hold spots, and then they'll get two victory points for each of these headquarter units that they eliminate. So that's really what they're trying to do. Um, and then the game comes down to who has the most victory points at the end, or there's an auto victory. The other interesting thing is the VC... Uh, near the end of the game, so as you're getting into turn 7 and even into turn 8, any VC that are left on the map, you're going to lose victory points for the end game. Meaning if it's gone the full 8 turns and you still have, say, 5 or 6 VC uh, on the end of the map, you're going to lose its half a victory point. Let me make sure that's right. Yeah, it's half a victory point, so you got to... You know, as a VC, when you're in turn eight, you got to figure out how to get your guys off the map. There's a thing up here that says exited VC units. So once they get off, they can't come back on and they are they don't count against your victory point total. So that is a look at a little bit of how Long Cruel Woman works. We went over some of the rules. You know, I'm going to be honest. This is a very fun and interesting game. I, uh, I did an interview with... Paul Rohrball on this game. I think it was in October or, no, or November of last year. And I really found it interesting. I, I find these small battles interesting. I enjoy, you know, exploring operational, strategic, and even tactical level of Vietnam. Um, we've played several games. Most recently, the most recent one I've played was Front Towards Enemy by Multiman Publishing. So we really enjoy that period. We find a lot of interest. One of our favorite games is Silver Bayonet, um, also Fire in the Lake, uh, which deals with Vietnam in the coin series. So I think this is a very interesting treatment of a very interesting battle that I don't think many of us know much about. I think the rules are very well written, and I think they meet the conditions of the time with the surprise markers, the opportunity fire, the wire breach, the added protection from the fire base. Uh, also, I forgot to tell you, but the, the Americans at certain time can call in for activation Arvin units. And these Arvin units are basically like a rifle unit. And they can come in for reinforcements. That becomes pretty important kind of in the mid to late game. I think the earliest round you can get those is round three, if I'm remembering uh, correctly. So anyway, they, they have some different reinforcements. I just really like this game. I think the star shells are a very nice touch. I think the opportunity fire on the barbed wire is very nice. I like the surprise. You know, Alexander and I have played a couple of these games, and there's been some really weird and interesting conditions that start the games off. One time, we at Fortunate Sons, I think you're completely surrounded, and the VC kind of gets... Uh, uh, it might have been NVA, but the NVA or VC get a lot of attacks, and it it's hard to survive that first round. But if you can, then you get a bunch of reinforcements. This game is kind of the same way. If you can survive this first card draw, get your you know half a dozen of your units unsurprised, get them organized, get them together, and making attacks back on the 
the attacking VC. It'll go better for you. But I like that it's it's a challenge. Um, I think that this game does that very well. The production value on this game is good for what you pay for. This this game costs eleven ninety five. It is a poly bag game. Uh, it's card stock for the map and the turn track and the player aid. Everything else is just paper. Um, so you, you know, once again, you're not paying forty or forty five dollars for this game. I paid a little bit extra for the mounted counters, and you'll see they actually come pre. Uh, mounted on white core and I didn't clip them because I thought they were perfect. They don't need to be clipped. Um, I, I like clipping, but I also don't like clipping if I don't have to. Uh, you also can pay a little extra for these cards. They are card stock. I like actually playing with the uh, um, playing cards. It just feels cool that I'm playing a war game with some some playing cards. But I, I think there's a lot of very interesting things about this game. I think it's a great value. I think it's an interesting experience. It learns, you learn a lot about history. It taught me stuff about, once again, this battle. And, and he does a good job of doing designer notes. Let me show you the, let me go to the back here. And my rules are actually very well worn. I've played this several times and flipping back and forth, I've got markings on them. But, you know, he puts a bibliography there. You can find the different readings that you can it's got three books, I think they're listed. And then here's some designer notes that actually start on the previous page uh, here titled uh, Designer's Notes. And you can see, I, I remember I mentioned that they riddled by drugs and incompetence and that the disaster was compounded by a cover-up that extended all the way up to the division commander. So that, that's a conclusion reached by a historian about uh, the condition here at Firebase Marianne. I like this game. It's fast. I didn't even talk to you about the Fortunes of War. Fortunes of War is just kind of an added in uh, bonus. The VC start with this Fortunes of War. This can force a card draw to be redone. It can force a die roll, like for a fire attack or a an assault or a, a an, an airstrike. You can force that to be re-rolled one time and then that chit flips over to your opponent and then they have it and can do the same thing. Uh, when they have a roll or a card draw or something they don't like, they can force that to be re-rolled. So lots of neat things in this. I like the inclusion of the random events because I think it adds some flavor into it. Uh, Paul does that in a lot of his games. We've played some of the Battles of the Old Northwest series and they use those random events. Just a well put together, very simple area movement war game. You know, it's not going to blow your socks off. It's not going to kick one of your more favorite hardcore Hex Encounter War games out of its spot on your top 10 list. But I, I enjoyed this one. In fact, I, I think when I'm done here, I'm going to play it one more time because I think I've relearned some things as I've talked about it here and uh, I've had a good time with this game. So once again, Long Cruel Woman, High Flying Dice Games designed by Paul Rohrbaugh. Uh, this is the video review. I'm going to try also to do a written review where I'll show some pictures of the different things that were going on because I, I think there's a lot of interesting things to learn from it. Um, and I'll, I'll do that written view, interview or re review here in the next couple of weeks. But I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the game. Once again, $11.95. You add the mounted counters and the cards, you might be up to $22. I still think that's a great value. This is a game that I've played now, I think, three times. I'll probably play it another one or two times before I put it back on the shelf. And it may be one of those games that I get out uh, someday uh, here soon. But I played it solo, remember. So I didn't play it two-player, and I thought it played very well. I thought the draw activation system worked. I'd love to play it with Alexander just so I can jaw back and forth with him. But I think this is a good time. So hope you enjoyed the video. Check the game out. Let me know what your thoughts are. If I messed a rule up, let me know. Uh, but I think in general, I covered uh, most of what's here. So thank you very much. I've been Grant with the Player's Aid.